I enhance student. I enhance student is a platform for law students to come here and deliver a lecture on the topic of their choice. Today, we have with us law student Aryan Zadar, who's going to deliver a lecture on the 42nd Constitutional Amendment. He is from Sri Jayantilal H. Patel College of Law. So without wasting further time, I would request Aryan Jadav to commence with the lecture. Thank you. A very good afternoon to one and all. My name is Aryan Jadav and today I have been invited over here uh, to speak on the 42nd Amendment Act of the Constitution of India. So firstly, I would like to thank Advocate Rahul sir for giving me this opportunity and inviting me here for speaking on this very knowledgeable topic. So before beginning, with what is 42nd Amendment Act, I'll just give you an overview of what the Constitution of India is. So the Constitution of India is the very basis and very foundation of this country and, and it is known as the very pillars which is holding this country intact together. So when this Constitution of India was being framed right from 1946 to 1949 and it was finally brought into action into enforcement on 26th January 1950, during those three years various debates various assemblies were formed during that point of time to, brought, to bring this particular document into uh, in action. The father of the Indian constitution, the very honourable Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar has played a very prominent role in this. So a constitution provides for its amendments from time to time. So there have been various various, various amendments of the constitution of India. Each and every year amendment happens. Some of it other times it happens after two or three years as well. But the 42nd amendment was the most controversial amendment in the history of constitutional amendments. This amendment came in the year 1976 when the Honorable Prime Minister was Indira Gandhi. So this was just a basic overview of what I am going to speak. Before beginning I would like to say that not, neither I am belonging to any political party nor I am supporting any political views. I am just presenting what the amendment was and I am just giving the critical analysis or an analysis of that particular amendment. So before beginning with the 42nd Amendment Act 1976, we need to understand a little bit of its background. What made the 42nd Amendment Act to come into the picture, to come into the play? So it all started in the early 1970s or even before that, when after the Honorable Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri passed away, the Honorable Prime Minister Indira Gandhi took away the baton from him and she became the Prime Minister. She was the first lady Prime Minister at that point of time. In 1969, there came a split in the Congress government. One faction was led by Indira Gandhi, the other faction was led by Moradji Desai. Now, Indira Gandhi's faction was completely in favour of Indira Gandhi, but some of the other leaders were feeling at that point of time that just because she is the daughter of the great Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru does not mean that she is supposed to ascend the throne. So, Kamarad sir, Atal Gari Vajpai, Murarji Desai, these all split from the particular uh, Congress and they formed their own individual political uh, party which was known as INCO, that is the Indian National Congress Organization. Now came the general elections in the year 1971. Indira Gandhi stood up for the elections. So, just, in, just a brief overview that those, for those who don't know that in order to be a minister or in order to be a prime minister for the parliament, you first have to be a member of parliament. That can be either of the Lok Sabha or the Rajya Sabha. For the Lok Sabha, you have to stand for the elections, you have to contest polls. Similar goes for the state ministers as well or the chief ministers as well. You have to be a member of the Legislative Assembly or a member of the Legislative Council. So the 1971 general elections came, Indira Gandhi stood up for the election. The opponent of Indira Gandhi was known as Mr. Raj Narayan. Now what he said, that when the polls were conducted and Indira Gandhi won out its prime colours, so what he said that she has been charged with electoral misconduct. She has used the officials of Election Commission of India and other uh, officials of central government in the election process for Mr. Madam Prime Minister. Now that is not allowed in the government or in the functioning of India. So, of India. so now what has happened is he has alleged that she is guilty of that. He filed a petition in the Honorable High Court of Allahabad. Four years have passed now from 1971 till 1975. In between, Indira Gandhi took very dynamic decisions. The first nuclear test was performed during her tenure. So she was on the verge of making India a strong 
and an independent nation. That was the start of India progressing. That was the start of India developing in those era. In 1975, 12th June was a historical day. Justice Sinha, who was the judge of Honorable High Court of Allahabad, he passed a decision and he found her guilty. He found the Honorable Madam Prime Minister guilty of the electoral misconduct which she has been charged with. Now, if she has been charged with electoral misconduct, if she has been charged with electoral malpractices, obviously her tenure of Lok Sabha was supposed to be ending. If we look into more detail, her tenure of Prime Minister was also in question then. So, after that, the order came, she was charged, her, question, uh, her whole uh, political career was in question at that point of time. She, she came back to Delhi. Now, this is already happening from the politics point of view, from the judiciary point of view. Now there was a prominent, prominent leader at that point of time known as Mr. Jay Prakash Narayan, also known as JP. Now there is a historical ground or maidan in Delhi known as Ram Lila Maidan. Many murchas, many rallies, many, many protests have been happened on that particular maidan or that particular ground. So he started a rally over there and the slogan was Sihasan Khali Karo Janta Aati Hai. He said to the public that don't uh, uh, cooperate with the army officials, don't cooperate with the police officials because they were doing lati charge. They were hitting and abusing the elders, the children, or the women who were a part of that larry. As a result of which, taking all of this into the consideration, on 25th of June, 1975, emergency was proclaimed all over India under Article 352 of the Constitution. Now, what is Article 352? It includes war, external aggression, and at that point of time, it was internal disturbances. Now it is armed rebellion. But at that point of time, it was internal disturbances. Taking all that into consideration, the emergency was imposed. Now, not only the emergency was imposed, there is an act known as MISA, that is Maintenance of Internal Security Act 1971. Now, what they did, due to that, the fundamental rights of the citizens are curtailed. Your Article 20, that is, uh, the right against uh, arbitrary conviction or arbitrary arrest, Article 21, that is the most essential article uh, of uh, the Constitution of India, that is right to life as personal liberty, the freedom of speech and expression of press as well as individuals, all was curtailed, all was restricted, there existed no fundamental rights at that point of time. That was the beginning of the fall of Indira Gandhi's tenure as a Prime Minister because already the questioning of a being an MP and a Prime Minister was already passed, the order was already passed by the Honorable uh, Allahabad High Court. Now the question was what do we do? All the opposition leaders, not all, but prominent opposition leaders like Jai Prakash Narayan, Moraji Desai, Atal Vyari Vajpayee, Sushma Swaraj, they were all arrested. They were all put behind the bars. There was no opposition in the Lok Sabha. Now you are, you are getting the point. The parliament having 545 members strength, there is no opposition. There is only a government and that too one sided with whole majority. And that is the point when things started to fall down. Now, the court proceedings were already going on. Indira Gandhi had appealed into the Honorable Supreme Court. The appeal stage was still going on. Now a very fancy amendment came. 39th Constitutional Amendment before 42nd Amendment. I am just giving you an overview so that you understand why 42nd Amendment, why was it brought and why was it draconian in nature. Through 39th Constitutional Amendment, there came an amendment stating and there came a clause stating that whenever a president or prime minister's election is in question, it cannot come under the judicial review of the courts. Now, Indira Gandhi's tenure was already, and it was given a retrospective effect. Now, her tenure was already in question. It was going before Allahabad High Court. They brought the amendment. Obviously, they had the majority. It was during the emergency era. The amendment was passed. Within a week or something, it was assented. Her, the order which came was set free. Now, a different parliamentary inquiry will be uh, done and they would be taking over the charge of this. So the judicial review was completely removed from this angle. Her prime ministerial election or her <coughs> parliament's tenure was completely secured at this particular point. But this was not it. Still the member of parliament from the opposition were inside the jail. Now came the 42nd Amendment Act. So what was the 42nd Amendment Act basically? It is also known as mini constitution and the reason mini constitution is because it had so many vast articles which were being changed. It was also popularly known as Indira's constitution at that point of time and uh, as the freedom of speech and expression of even press was curtailed at that point of time, 
they printed blank papers as a way of protest, as a way of protesting. That these are the blank papers, you don't want us to print anything, we will not print anything, but we will still uh, publish the papers. So that was the autocracy or that was the despotism which was going on at that point of time. So 42nd amendment was brought, was introduced into the Lok Sabha. 1st November 1976, it was being debated. Now, there are, I, I, the, the amendment is very vast. I don't know whether I'll be able to cover all the amendments or not, but I'll be taking certain important ones which were brought. <coughs> the first and the foremost would be amending the preamble of the constitution. Now, this was such a hectic task or a hindrance to the functioning of the government or the country, I would say. Now, many people have this misconception that preamble is the view of the founding fathers. I am not, still not able to understand that why people think that preamble is the view of the founding fathers. Suppose for an example if it is a view, that means it is a plan that how the uh, country should function, how the country should be. That is the view, that is the plan. But preamble was the last thing that was drafted in the constitution. Preamble was not the first thing. If it was a view, if it was a plan, plan hum pehle banayenge. According to that we will work, according to that the constitution is supposed to be uh, drafted. But no, preamble was the last thing which was drafted. So the preamble in actual sense is the reflection of the constitution. What is the constitution reflecting? What is the constitution meaning? Now for an, I'll, and they were trying to amend the constitution, uh, sorry, amend the preamble. How? Now for example, I'm standing here, I'm the constitution. There is a mirror in front of me. My reflection is coming on the mirror. Now you are trying to keep me intact. You are trying to keep the constitution impact, intact. But the reflection of mind, which is coming on the mirror, you're trying to change that reflection. Now, how can you keep the object whose reflection it is the same as it is, but you're trying to amend the reflection of mind? So, what they did in the preamble, and but before, uh, like sorry, uh, sorry to cut to, but in 1974, with regards to the preamble of landmark judgment had come, which is known as the Keshwan and the Bharti versus State of Kerala. Now all, I think law students, all legal professionals, all lawyers, all judges must be knowing this case who called by group. It was a right to property dispute. So at that point of time, right to property was a fundamental right. Later on it was uh, converted into a legal right. So what the Honorable Justices at that point of time said that, though the parliament has the power to amend the constitution under article 368, it cannot amend the basic structure of the constitution and preamble being the basic structure of the constitution, how is the parliament amending it? So, we are a country where constitutional supremacy is there. We are not a country like Britain where parliamentary supremacy is there. Because our constitution is written, it is rigid. Britain's constitution is unwritten. There is no written constitution specifically and with rigidity as is India's. So, they are trying to amend the preamble when it is already been stated by the honourable Supreme Court, that is the apex court, that you cannot alter the basic structure of the constitution. So the words secular and socialist were added through the 42nd amendment. Now what do you mean by secular and socialist? Let's come first to that. Because there was no specific definition given at that point of time. What do you mean by socialism? Or what do you mean by secularism? How are you trying to give that in the preamble and how are you expecting people to abide by it when it is not even given in the constitution explicitly what does these two uh, words mean? So but before coming that, I think you all must be finding this on Google or something. This is an official report of the Constituent Assembly debate, which happened in the year from the year 1946 to the year 1949. What happened in this Constituent Assembly was that there was a professor known as KT Shah. He proposed for the first time, that is 30 years before the 42nd Amendment, that the word secular and socialist should come into the preamble of the Constitution. Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar objected to this. He said. How can we add the word secular and socialist? This is 30 years ago. Now look at the thought process of that man. Look at the view. Look how far-fetched his thinking. And within the other framers of the constitution as well. Because there was a whole constituent assembly. All were the framers. But Professor Ketisha proposed this. So what he said, if we are adding the word socialist, that means we are dictating what is the policy of the state. But what should be the policy of the state and what should not be the policy of the state should be left to the people to decide for themselves. Because if we are trying to hinder with that, then that would be destroying democracy altogether. And the reason this is all happening, the reason we are framing this constitution is to make India a democratic country, is to make India a republic country. So the thought process was so wise because 
the same thing happened. What do you mean by socialism? Socialism means that everything is in the hands of the government. The government equally divides it among the individuals. But today, if we look at our country's picture, is India a socialist economy or is India a socialist country? No, it is not. It is a mixed economy. But it is not even a capitalist economy and it is not even a socialist economy. It is in between. Because some of the major parts are in the hands of the central government or the state governments. Some of the other parts are in the hands of the industrialists. So at that point of time, we thought of this in the year 1949. So such was his thought process. And that is the reason the whole framers of the constitution supported him. And he said, no, no, this should not be allowed. This motion was negated. But still in the year 1976, they sort of bringing this amendment to the preamble. And they sort of um, indulging the word secular and socialist in it. So now with regards to socialism or secularism, they were not mentioning what socialism is. Is it, is it Marxist socialism? Which Russia or USSR at that point of time were imbibing with them. No, they were not even mentioning that. So what is the socialism we are supposed to follow? And with respect to secularism. Now, let's get this point straight that India is a multilinguistic nation. There are varied religions living in this country. There are Buddhists, there are Jains, there are Hindus, there are Sikhs, there are Parsis, there are Muslims, there are Christians. Different set of religions are living here. The Article 24 and 25 are, is giving us the right to profess any religion we want without any hindrance or something. And that is a fundamental right. But adding that word secular in the preamble, that word secular is from the state's point of view. Now from the state's point of view, what does secularism mean or secular mean? That the state does not have a religion of its own. Now if the state does not have a religion of its own, then the functioning of the country, the whole uh, arena which is happening today, each and every religion is making day after day tomorrow, stating that if that religion is getting these rights, then even we should get it because it is a secular nation. The word secular was not there before, that is, uh, before the 42nd amendment. The whole ruckus or the whole hindrance which is happening in the nation right now, its seed was uh, sown at that point of time. At that time of time, maybe the amendments which were being the framers, uh, that thought process would have been different. They would have wanted secularism to be a complete different uh, objective. That is a different kind of thing. But then they should have mentioned it. What does secularism actually mean from the state's point of view? Because nowhere in the constitution it is mentioned. What does secularism mean? And if you are imbibing it, then in our country, uh, let's take an example. There are some personal laws or personal privileges to a particular sect of religion. They are enjoying those personal laws. They are enjoying those personal uh, privileges. What happens now? Each and every religion is contradicting that. Right? If India is a secular country, or if India is a secular nation, then how are they getting it and why are we not getting it? If all religions are equal in the eyes of law, then everyone should be getting those advantages. Everyone should be getting those privileges. Besides, if India is a secular country, according to that particular thing, then the grant which is given to the educational institutions, which is handled by religious organizations, now there are many educational institutions which are handled by religious organizations, but only to that, those specific religious organizations, the education institutions, the central government or the state government is giving the grant. Now, if the state does not have a religion of its own, if all the religions are equal in the eyes of law, then how is how are they giving it to only one particular sect or one particular religion and not to all of them? So the whole ruckus which is happening, the whole, uh, I think many riots also happened because of this thing. So why did it happen? The basis was this. So that was with respect to the preamble. Now we come to the main part. That is the fundamental rights and DPSP, the contradiction between them. Now everyone must be knowing this, that part three of the constitution covers the fundamental rights. Part four of the constitution covers the directive principles of the state policy. Now fundamental rights are enforceable rights. DPSP is not enforceable right. So let, let us go into a, a little bit of detail what do you mean by enforceable rights and non-enforceable rights. So for an example, if I am having article 21 that is right to life and personal liberty and if it is getting curtailed or if it is getting diminished by this honorable government or by any state body or any central body, I have the authority to file the writ petition or a public interest litigation in the honorable Supreme Court or the High Court of India. But same thing if it happens with respect to uh, the directive principles of the state policy, it is not necessary or it is not enforceable that it can happen in the Honorable Supreme Court or the High Court as well. You cannot file a red petition because the government is not enforced by it. It is not a guaranteed right. Fundamental right is a guaranteed right. Now what they did is, 
So Article 31C comes into the play over here. Now many have this confusion or many have this uh, dilemma that 31C was brought by the 42nd Amendment. So no, it was not. 31C was brought way back earlier than the 42nd Amendment. So what does 31C state? That any law which is being made with respect to 39B and 39C, that is the directive principles of the state policy. Even if it is overriding the fundamental rights, it will still be valid. That is what 31C stated. Now what amendment they brought in 42nd to 42nd is that the scope and the power of 31C was increased so much that they said that any DPSP or any law made, made with respect to DPSP, even if it is overriding fundamental rights, will be valid and will not be void. Now are you imagining this thing? Because there is a landmark judgment which was given by Supreme Court in the early 1950s. They stated that wherever there is a conflict between Supreme Court, sorry, uh, between fundamental rights and directive principles of the state policy, the fundamental rights will always prevail. But now what they are stating is no, no. If it is in the interest of the national public or in the national integrity, and if the government is making any laws or the parliament is making any laws, with respect to the directive principles of the state policy, and even if they are hindering the fundamental rights, even then the uh, directive principles of the state policy will prevail. Now this would have been absolutely arbitrary in nature for the other uh, generations to come, or the other decades to come. Because firstly, the citizens' fundamental rights, the very essence of the constitution would have been destroyed. The basic structure of it would have been destroyed. The, the way we are today, the way we have a fundamental right to freedom of speech and expression would have been gone. The way we have a fundamental right to profess our uh, particular religion, a particular trade, or particular business, whatever we want, would have been curtailed completely if this particular amendment would have been allowed at that point of time. But obviously, they had the majority, so they did pass it. Now, this was the autocracy, or this was the discordism that was going on of the parliament at that point of time from the government's point of view. Because there was no opposition. Opposition was in the jail. Now, after that, after the fundamental rights and DPSP, we come to the part and the main important part of the constitutional validity or the power of judicial review of the High Court and the Supreme Court. Now, I think many of us know this, what is a writ petition? Whenever a, fund, a fundamental right is getting violated, you file a writ petition in the Honorable High Court or the Supreme Court. And if you are going to the Supreme Court, you go under Article 32. If you go to the High Court, you go under Article 226. Be it any law, be it central law or be it state law, you can file a writ petition in the Honorable Supreme Court. Be it a central law or be it a state law, you can file the Honorable uh, writ petition in the High Court as well as Supreme Court both. That is the power of the High Courts and the Supreme Courts which is guaranteed to, do, uh, guaranteed to them by the Constitution of India. And the power of High Courts with respect to writs is much more wider than the power of Supreme Courts. Because High Court is covering fundamental as well as legal rights. What amendment they are bringing into the picture is that they are stating that no, if you are going to Supreme Court, you can only challenge the constitutional validity of the central laws. If you are going to the high courts, you, are, you can only challenge the constitutional validity of the state laws. Now, how can this happen? The power of high courts is much more wider and you are completely scrapping away from high courts and vice versa to the Supreme Court. You are stating that only the state laws, sorry, the central laws can be challenged and its constitutional validity can be challenged in the Supreme Court. How is this possible? The hierarchy of courts, that is the Supreme Court, High Court, then the division, uh, district courts and so on and so forth. There has always been a hierarchy of courts. We are completely scrapping down that hierarchy. The power of judicial review is getting restrained over there. Next thing what they did is, they said that whenever a constitutional validity is to be challenged in the Honorable Supreme Court, a bench of at least seven judges should be there. And that to two-third majority should come. Now that is the absolute discretion of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of India. That is the highest post of the judicial system. And you are taking away that power from him. What is the basic structure of the constitution? And what is one of the essence of it? That is separation of powers. It is executive, judiciary and legislative. That means executive will not bother the judiciary. Judiciary will not bother the legislative. They will not interrupt in each, each and everyone's functioning. The parliament is completely overlapping its jurisdiction, coming into the part of judiciary, and they are stating that no, you can only adjudge the matters which are of central laws. State uh, high court will only adjudge the matter of state laws, and you all have to do a seven judge bench. How come? 
how is this possible? How is this feasible? Isn't the Chief Justice of India a very honourable and respectable position? Doesn't he have his separate identity? Isn't judiciary a separate entity from legislative and executive? And the executive is completely barging into it. After that, what happened is, now many people must be knowing this, the word anti-national has a lot of essence. Uh, many people have been claimed to be anti-nationalists. But when was this anti-national word used for the first time? It was in this amendment. It was in the 42nd amendment. Now, tell me one thing. There was no proper definition given of national only at that point of time. It is not there even today. But let's talk about the era of 1970s. There was no proper definition given of the word national. And they are putting a whole clause of who had anti-national group. Emergency is going on. Half of the opposition is in jail and the government bringing an amendment in the constitution for anti-nationals. You are looking at a thought process of what they were thinking. They can tame anyone of us to be an anti-national. They can put us behind bars. And the very beautiful clause which they added was that stating that if any law is made with respect to anti-nationals and even if it is hindering or violating or curtailing the fundamental rights of the citizens, it will still be valid. And the power of making the laws with respect to 31D is only in the hands of central government and not the state government. Those of you who don't know, there are two forms of government, unitary form and federal form. Now what is unitary form of government? Well, there are absolute power or the whole power is in the hands of the central government. What is federal form of government? When there is an equal division of power among all the state governments. But India is neither a unitary form of government, India is neither a federal form of government. India is a quasi-federal form of government. Now, what do we understand by the term quasi-federal? Quasi-federal means that though the power is equally divided among the state, but the central government has the strong inclination of the power. So like if you see most of the things like defense, or army, uh, railways, external affairs, all these important portfolios are still in the hands of the central government. They are not in the hands of the state government. That is the reason India is a quasi-federal structure. But they imbibing a law stating that the state government is not allowed only to make a law on this particular thing. That is the internal part of it. This comes under the home ministry. Now even the state governments have home ministries. But they are sitting, you know, anti-national case, relation mein, koi bhi law banega, only central government has the power and not the state government. Completely shifting the structure of the constitution of being a quasi federal to a unitary. Seventh schedule, that means education and everything, when they were brought, even they were shifted from the state to the central. So the quasi federal form of government was getting diminished a part by bit and it was being made into a unitary form of government. So this was with respect to the preamble, then to the directive principles of the state policy and the fundamental rights. And then now we discuss the judicial hierarchies and how the power of uh, the Supreme Court and the High Courts to adjudge on the constitutional validity was getting hindered. Then we came to the anti-national elements. Now we come to Article 352 and the emergency provisions which was getting amended over here. Like, so what Article 352 meant? that whenever there is war or external aggression or internal disturbance at that point of time, you can impose an emergency throughout the nation. But it has to be a country as a whole. You cannot uh, implement emergency in one particular district, one particular territory, one particular region. No, you can't do that. You have to impose emergency throughout the nation. Now, when this emergency was imposed, the protest was going on only in Ramlila Maidan. That is Delhi, another part of India. The disturbance was not happening throughout India because India is so big. It has the northeast, it has the south, it has the west, it has the east. But only north was protesting at that point of time under the leadership of Jai Prakash Narayan. Of course, there was George Fernandes from Mumbai, there were protests going on. But these were all small, small regions. As a nation, as a whole, it was not there. What amendment they brought is that now Article 352 can be imposed not only on the whole nation, but even if one small territory or one particular region, even there, Article 352 can be imposed, emergency can be imposed. So it was a smoothening function for the next decades to come that whenever they want to impose an emergency, they don't have to wait, they don't have to justify that why emergency is to be imposed in the whole nation. They can impose it into one particular region or one particular territory as well. 
so i don't know what they were thinking or from what point of view they were thinking but while reading it this is all one can understand that what was the government's point of view or what was the government's thought process to um, uh, to bring those amendments into the particular picture uh, through the 42nd amendment act so this happened now article 368 is one of the most essential article in the constitution of india what it does it gives the parliament the power to amend the constitution but there is an unwritten code there is an unwritten law or there, there might be an explicit law if i was to say that whatever constitutional amendments are brought whatever the parliament does it all comes under the purview of judicial review what do you mean by judicial review now for an example if i am a parliamentarian person i am the member of a parliament or i am belonging to the government we pass a particular amendment it becomes a part of the constitution it is now a law which is to be uh, followed by the people throughout the country but what if it is arbitrary in nature or what if it is despotic in nature or autocratic in nature from the part of the state or the part of the government what happens then your fundamental rights are getting curtailed so you can file a writ petition in the honorable high court or in the honorable supreme court challenging its constitutional validity now if you are challenging its constitutional validity it is coming under the purview of judiciary that is the meaning of judicial review what amendment they brought through section 55 they stated that whenever an amendment is being brought in the constitution by the parliament under article 368 of the constitution it must be absolute there must be no limitation and it cannot come under the purview of judicial review so whatever amendments they want to bring whatever amendments they want to enforce into the constitution or enforce into the country of india they can bring any amendments but it will not come under the purview of judicial review how is it possible the nature of the constitution is that as i said there is separation of powers executive judiciary and legislative and why was it done so that no particular organization or no particular sect overpowers the other one or doesn't act ultra wise to the constitution because constitution is the supreme authority there is no one beyond it and it may it ensures it follow it uh, makes proof that all three are working in abidance to me why so that no neither the parliament nor the executive nor the judiciary is overpowering each other or neither one of them is acting ultra wise to it but the parliament stating that whatever amendments we are bringing or whatever tomorrow they might change the whole constitution of india because they are clearly stating that they can amend alter or modify in any which way they want without any limitation and that cannot even come under the purview of judicial review our constitution could have been changed 10 times till now in this past 50 years who would have been responsible because there was no opposition there was no one to protest in the lok sabha there was no one to protest in the rajya sabha the government is passing on those laws and after that and after that a judgment came in the year 1980 i will be covering that I'll, i'll just uh, in, the, in the next few minutes so this was some of the major amendments which were brought to the 42nd constitutional amendment now what happened in the month of march 1977 the emergency came to an end emergency came to an end 42nd amendment was already brought into the picture all the opposition leaders were released morarji desai atal bihari vajpayee and jay prakash narayan these were they were all released why because the government at that moment of time was thinking that on the face value of it or through a chance we would swipe through the polls we would bring an absolute majority and we will win this general elections like anything of the year 1977 but the scenario went completely different morarji desai atal bihari vajpayee and jay prakash narayan emerged as prominent and excellent leaders they gave the slogan of sampurna kranti they enriched or imbibed in the minds of the citizens that what happened during the terms of the time of the britishers is happening again now it is not a democracy anymore it is a dictatorship it is there is no republic there is no democracy the prime minister and his cabinet is acting totally autocratic and even some members of parliament belonging to the congress faction of indira gandhi even they felt that this is going arbitrary this is going autocratic they left that political party they came to morarji desai they came to atal bihari vajpayee and they formed a whole new organization under the name of janata party or janata dal 1977 for the first time in the history of india a new political party which is not congress emerged victorious and they became the first party to have the government in the central morarji desai became the prime minister and and uh, it was uh, they, they said it was the vachan or the promise that they would turn over or they would diminish 
the evils or the defects of the 42nd Amendment Act, and they would bring new amendments. As a result of which, they stayed on their word. They tried to replenish all those things. They brought the 43rd and 44th Amendment. Major of uh, that, except leaving the preamble apart, they tried to amend many of things, and they tried to bring back into force the Constitution as it was. But still. The one thing which was left was Article 368 and the power of the Constitution, sorry, the power of the Parliament to supersede even the power of judicial reviews of the High Courts and Supreme Courts. So Minerva Mills, uh, our judiciary, came as a landmark judgment, Minerva Mills in the year 1980. The court stated that even if Article 368 is giving the power to the Parliament to amend the Constitution, nothing is outside the purview of the courts. Nothing is outside the purview of high courts and supreme courts or the judiciary. It will come under the purview of judiciary as a result of which it was again established and it came under the uh, uh, judicial review. Hence our constitution was saved up to a larger extent. Because the changes which they were bringing, like they said that India is a socialist country. Now let's take an example. In the 1990s or early 1990s, when recession dropped in, if our country is a socialist economy and all the uh, uh, functioning is in the hands of the government, but at that point of time, our Honorable Prime Minister P. V. Narasimha Rao understood that recession has come in. We are almost on the verge of bankruptcy. Our country as a whole is going on the verge of bankruptcy. The only way to protect it. And so he gave the motto of liberalization, privatization, globalization. Now what does this mean? It means that the foreign direct investments or industries or factories or companies from foreign countries were allowed to come into India and they were allowed to invest in India. It was not allowed before that. There were some exceptions as well, but not as a whole. So India being a socialist economy, how did they allow it then? There are still many uh, backdrops or drawbacks in our law, legal systems, but slowly and gradually, there have been chances to try to cover them up or to try to replenish them or to try to convert them into the strengths again. So this was all about the 42nd Constitutional Amendment, is what I have studied, is what I have thought. Uh, nowhere do I say that I know each and everything about this particular thing. There, there have been things that I think I might have been wrong. The constitutional framers or the parliamentarians might have thought that this thing is supposed to be necessary into the preamble or into the constitution. So that is all from my uh, part. Thank you so much. It was a nice experience to hear from you uh, analysis of 42nd amendment. It was a nice analysis, nice dissection done by you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for inviting me over. Please.